This morning, I find myself giving a rather different sermon than the one I had originally planned. Yesterday's mass shooting at the Tree of Life congregation in Pittsburgh, the week's bomb threats by a would-be right-wing terrorist, and the current presidential administration's ongoing assault on truth, decency, civility, and transgender rights require it. Today, we need to stop and recognize where we are. Today, we need to stop and articulate who we are. Today, we need to stop and talk about what we must do. And I'm going to start my sermon by doing something that might seem a little bit odd to all of you. I'm going to take off my stole. Now, I wear this stole as a symbol of my religious office signifies that I'm an ordained Unitarian Universalist minister. And I'm going to take off my stole right now because I want to address you for a few minutes from a different place, from a place that is not completely your minister. And I recognize that's not entirely possible. I'm in the pulpit right now, and I am the religious leader of this community. But for a little while, I want to consciously address you from another place, another role I inhabit. See, I'm not just a parish minister. I'm also a scholar. I have a PhD from Harvard University. And one of the things I specialize in is in the study of white supremacist, white nationalist movements, and totalitarian regimes. Just last month, I gave a talk at San Francisco State University on the political ideology of the Ku Klux Klan. And so I want to be clear that the things I'm saying right now are not things I say lightly. And I want to be clear that I'm saying, someone, saying them with someone who has the full authority of having spent years of his life studying the dynamics of terror and authoritarianism and white supremacy. And what I want to say is this. I think this country is on the verge of becoming a totalitarian state. More precisely, this country is on the verge of being ruled by a neo-confederate regime. And in many ways, it already is. The country has become what's called a mixed political regime, which is to say that it exhibits characteristics of totalitarianism even while it remains formally a liberal democracy. And so I'm going to talk with you for a few minutes about each of those claims, because I think it is important to understand where we are in the arc of human history. We cannot live authentically as a religious community. We do not recognize the context in which we inhabit, the moment in which we live. We need to recognize where we are if we are to live our faith authentically. This country is on the verge of becoming a totalitarian state. Totalitarian states are organized around the, character, around the personality of a charismatic leader who personifies the state's power. The totalitarian state seeks global domination and the total subjugation of all who live within its borders. Its leaders identify a racial or minority group who must be purged from the body politic in order for their vision of society to thrive. Totalitarian states have no respect for the rule of law. Instead, they concentrate power in the head of state. The Nazi philosopher Carl Schmitt described this last dynamic most clearly when he argued, sovereign is he who makes the exception. By this he meant that the sovereign, the person who holds power, is inherently above law because he is the law. Therefore, the sovereign can do nothing illegal. Since he is the law, any action he takes is fundamentally legal. If this sounds familiar, it should. There are clear vet parallels between Schmidt's views and those of the man just confirmed as associate justice of the Supreme Court. The newest justice appears to believe that the president cannot be subpoenaed by employees of the Justice Department because they work for him. 
because he is essentially above the law. This is not the only parallel to be found among right-wing partisans and totalitarian philosophers and politicians. The philosopher Hannah Arendt pointed out that in order to function, totalitarian regimes have a deliberately loose relationship with the truth. She wrote, totalitarian politics use and abuse their own ideological and political elements until the basis of factual reality have all but disappeared. Let me repeat that quote. Totalitarian politics use and abuse their own ideological political elements until the basis of factual reality have all but disappeared. The constant cries of fake news and attacks on the press by the man who currently holds the nation's highest office should make Arendt's dynamics sound familiar. Arendt has much to teach us about what totalitarian is and how it functions. In her classic text, The Origins of Totalitarianism, Arendt makes two further observations about it. First, it is based on the politics of terror. Second, its origins lie in anti-Semitism. In a totalitarian regime, no one is ever secure. The threat of arbitrary violence haunts every waking. People who live under a totalitarian regime never know when or where violence will erupt. They only know, regardless of who they are or what they have done, they may meet a terrible end. Arendt tells us, in a totalitarian regime, nobody can ever be free of fear. Terror, she warns, strikes without preliminary provocation. Its victims, objectively innocent, chosen regardless of what they may, may or may not have done. As I offer you those words, I want you to think about this country's epidemic of gun violence. And I want us to pause and hold in our hearts yesterday's 11 victims of anti-Semitic gun violence at the Tree of Life congregation in Pittsburgh. Yesterday's attack on a synagogue would not have surprised Arendt. She understood that anti-Semitism was an essential element of totalitarianism. Totalitarians gain power by identifying a societal enemy, a scapegoat on whom they then lay the blame for society's ills. Jews are often the scapegoats. For hundreds of years, there have been those who blame a secret conspiracy of Jews for the world's ills. This idea was at the root of Nazism, and it is present in the discourse of those contemporary politicians who seem to aspire to totalitarianism. The Hungarian philanthropist and investment banker George Soros comes from a Jewish family. He survived the Holocaust. Today, Viktor Orban, the prime minister of Hungary, Jair Bolsonaro, who's running to be president in Brazil, and the current president of the United States have all attacked him for supporting progressive causes. Soros was one of the targets of last week's bomb threats. During the contentious struggle over the most recent appointment of a Supreme Court justice, the president tweeted that protesters against the then nominee were professionals who were paid by Sor George Soros and others. Yesterday, the president laughed when someone at one of his rallies shouted out the word Soros when he attacked the globalists who are cheating American workers. The word globalist, along with the word cosmopolitan, I have to tell you, have long histories of being code words by anti-Semites for Jews. Globalists in totalitarian regimes and in the narratives of men like Orban and the current president of the United States are in league with another enemy. For them, that enemy today is migrants, the Mexicans who many fear are coming to take their jobs. Jimmy Santiago reminds us that such narratives serve the powerful, not the weak, when he writes, I see this and I hear only a few people got all the money in the world. 
the rest count their pennies to buy bread and butter. Totalitarianism divides society in order to preserve the privilege of the powerful. It targets migrants and transgender people and people of color because they provide an easy target to confuse the rest of us about what are the actual root causes of our problem. This is what has happened before, and I see this today when I say I think this country is on the verge of becoming a totalitarian state. We have a charismatic leader who feels he is above the rule of law. There are widespread campaigns of lies, terror, anti-Semitism, the intentional targeting of migrants, the intentional targeting of transgender people, the intentional targeting of other people of color. These are all present with us today. The totalitarian state I fear emerging is not a generic totalitarian state. It is one that is deeply rooted in American culture. It is an aspiring neo-confederate regime. Let me explain. Since its inception, a leading strain of American thought, culture, and economic practice has been brazenly white supremacist. The Constitution was written in favor of slaveholding states. The Electoral College is partially a legacy of slavery. It was designed to ensure that southern slave states had disproportionate power in the new republic. Otherwise, they threatened secession. Indeed, when a split electorate chose an anti-slavery politician as president, the South did secede. The Civil War was a war to maintain chattel slavery and white supremacy. It was also a war to maintain male supremacy. The two substantive differences between the United States Constitution and the Confederate States Constitution were that the second proclaimed that only whites and only men could ever be citizens. When I label the president, present presidential administration neo-Confederate, I'm explicitly thinking of the Confederacy's claim to white male superiority. The president's recent choice for a Supreme Court justice and his appointment of Jeff Sessions to attorney general can be read as a commitment to an ideology that puts the needs and rights of white males over and against the rights of everyone else. I use the label neo-confederate to place the presidential administration within the context of American history. I use it to remind us that this country's rising forces of reaction are not a foreign threat. They represent cultural and political traditions that are deeply embedded in this country. I use it to remind us that the struggle we face today is not the struggle of our generation alone. It is a struggle that has been going on ever since abolitionists were brave enough to imagine that this country could offer citizenship to all, black, white, male, female, transgender. It is a struggle that was at the root of the civil rights movement, and it is a struggle that continues today. Finally, I want to turn to my claim that this country has become a mixed regime. In some ways, the state is already functioning like a full-blown totalitarian regime. We have seen this in the caging of children at board the border. We have seen it in the attack on transgender rights. We have seen it in the impunity of police officers when they kill people of color. We have seen it in the way that the president attacks the press as the enemy of the people. We have seen it in the way that he attacks private citizens who disagree with him. In a mixed regime, multiple kinds of political systems are present. For many people of color, for many migrant immigrants, for many transgender people, the United States is already essentially a totalitarian regime. And yet it maintains aspects of liberal democracy. Many of us especially people like me, who one of my friends likes to say have the complexion connection, still have the right to vote. We still have freedom of speech. We still can tell the truth. We still can denounce lies. We can still feel safe in our own homes and our places of work. Such privileges are not true for all of us. 
And to name that dynamic is to recognize that for many people in the United States, totalitarian has already totalitarianism has already arrived. This country is on the verge of becoming a totalitarian state. It is on the verge of transforming into a neo-Confederate regime. For many people, it already is one. All this political philosophy and history is dense material for a Sunday morning. I admit it's not exactly sermon fair, but I think it is important for me to tell you it today. And so now I'm going to put my stole back on. And I'm going to read a letter that Bob Miller and I sent this morning to the congregation Jewish Community North, where our tapestry campus rents space. Then I'm going to invite Mark and the choir to sing to us, and then I'll offer you a brief homily about who we are and what we must do. Dear Rabbi Seeger and members of the Congregation Jewish Community North, like people of good faith everywhere, we are distressed to learn of yesterday's attacks on the Tree of Life congregation in Pittsburgh. Anti-Semitism is a vile form of hatred. We mourn this week's dead in Pittsburgh. We mourn all the millions whose lives have been lost over the centuries to anti-Semitism. We join our voices with those who denounce it. We join our hands with those who work against it. We join our hearts with those who weep at the devastation that it continues to cause. Our Tapestry Campus is honored to share space with your congregation. If there's anything we can do for you, please let us know. This includes working with you to support any existing or future plans around security. On behalf of the First Unitarian Universalist Church of Houston, we offer a prayer for a peaceful world free from hatred and violence. Love the Reverend Dr. Colin Bosson, Interim Senior Minister, Bob Miller, Board President. Originally, I was going to offer you a sermon specifically tailored to the last days of the month and the final days of next month, or first days of next month. The end of October and the beginning of November are home to a host of holidays, Samhain, Halloween, the Day of the Dead, All Souls, Neo-pagan theologian Starhawk describes this time of year as when the veil between the worlds becomes thin. Across different cultures and within different religious traditions, people gather to remember ancestors, to mourn the dead, to reflect upon mortality, and consider each of our places within the cycle of life. Now, I don't think we have need or time for a full sermon in light of all I have just said. So instead, I want to relate the season's holidays to the events of the hour. Earlier I said it is important to recognize where we are, but that's not enough. We need to articulate who we are and what we must do. These are tasks for the religious community. As the president of our association, the Reverend Susan Frederick Gray has told us, this is no time for a casual faith or a casual commitment to your values your community, your congregation, your soul, and your faith. When we articulate who we are and what we must do, we become anything but a casual faith. Out of respect for the season's holidays, I want to hone in on a single aspect of who we are and what we must do. We are a community of memory. This is one of the gifts of religious community. It offers us the opportunity to take part in conversations that stretch beyond a single generation. It gives us the chart part to be opportunity to be part of something that will survive us. It lets us find hope and wisdom in those who have gone before us. And in doing so, it enables us to create, connect to something that is greater than ourselves, the flow of human history. When we do, we are reminded that our lives are transitory, and yet at the same time, we are reminded that we leave much behind when we die, and that this is true for us no matter humble, how humble or haughty we were when we trod upon this muddy blue ball of a planet. 
As a community of memory, we describe what is and what has been. This truth-telling is one of the most important functions of a religious community in times like these. We are reminded of it when we read the poetry of someone like Anna Akhmamanatov, that magnificent poet who survived Stalin's terror. In her great poem, Requiem, she reminds us that simply describing what is is one of the ways, the, simply describing the what is of the horrors of the world is a profound act of resistance. Writing of her time in the Gulag, she recounts a conversation she had with another inmate. Could one ever describe this? And I answered, I can. And it was then that something like a smile slid across what had previously be just been a face. As a community of memory, our church exists across time, across the generations. This is a story that preachers like to tell about how participating in a community like this can draw out draw us out of the private pains of our own lives and connect us with the justice, the peace, and the truth that sustain the world. The story is about the cathedral at Chartres. It's in France, located just outside of Paris. It's considered to be one of the true treasures of the world, the sort of thing that inspires flights of poetry and stirrings of the soul. The stained glass I've read is particularly beautiful. Edith Wharton tried to capture something of it in her poem, Chart. Immense, august, like some titanic bloom, the mighty choir unfolds its lilith core, petaled with panes of azure, ghouls and ore, splendidly lambent in the gothic gloom, stamened with keen flamelets that illume the pale high altar. Like many a uh, medieval cathedral, it took years to build. Many of the people who started to build it died before it was completed. Or they began working on the church when they were young adults and finished it when they were grandparents. One day in the middle of construction, the story goes, a traveler came to the town. She went to the site just as the construction for the day was winding down. She asked one worker covered in dust what he did. He was a stonemason. She asked the next. He was a glass blower. She asked another, a blacksmith. As the traveler wandered into the cathedral's interior, she encountered a woman with a broom. She was sweeping up the chips from the stonemason. She was picking up fragments of iron left behind by the blacksmith. She was cleaning up the cast aside incandescent filaments from the glass blower. The traveler asked the woman what she was doing. She paused. She leaned on her broom. She looked up at the column without a roof, at the windows without panes, at the floors without pag flagstones, and said, me? I'm building a cathedral for the glory of God Almighty. Unitarian Universalists don't generally build cathedrals for the glory of God Almighty. There are a few exceptions. Unity Temple outside of Chicago, First Unitarian Church of Rochester, Universalist Memorial Church in Washington, D.C. But for the most part, the best parts of our tradition have done something else. They have sought to maintain the human in the face of the demonic. They have struggled against the totalitarian regimes of yesteryear. They have sought to build the better world, the world that has almost come, always, but is never quite here. Women like Margaret Fuller, men like Ralph Waldo Emerson, women like Francis Elkin, Elkin Watkins, James Luther Adams, or today Mark Morrison Reed and Susan Frederick Gray, have repeatedly called out from the depths of our tradition to remind us that we are our most human, when we are seekers of truth, peace, and justice. Their teachings are a gift we have given to the world. It is the cathedral we have sought to build, generation to generation, the metaphoric stone by metaphoric stone. It is incomplete. 
What we are called to do today is to do our part, to contribute our bit to this great work of sustaining the world through truth, justice, and peace. On a day like today, we honor the ancestors, the Theodore Parkers and the Elizabeth Palmer Peabody's, the Sophia Fawes and the Cl Clarence Skinners who have gone before. We remember the dead of this congregation, the women and men who have sustained it across previous generations. They sustained it in part so that we could contribute our own brings to the great cathedral of justice. Adorn Strombler, Sarah Nelson Crawford, and John Kellett, none of whom I knew, helped to make this community what it is, a community devoted to love and justice, sustained across time in pursuit of truth and peace. When we gather, we honor them. When we gather, we unite with the many who have gone before and contribute to the great struggles that we now find ourselves engaged in. Now, of course, the scholar in me wants to offer a footnote how this is not the all of our tradition, or even the majority of it. And I could point out that the white supremacist John C. Calhoun, the man who was once called the Marx of the master class, was a Unitarian. But I'm not really going to do that. <laughs> Instead, I want to suggest that this is the best part of our tradition. It's the part of our tradition that we are called to honor. And it is a tradition that teaches us that one of the most radical acts is simply to assert our own humanity in the face of de de dehumanizing totalitarianism. Friends, in times like these, we are called to speak truth. We are called to work for justice. We are called to march, to protest, to sit down, to stand up, to sit in, to be cogs in the wheels of the machine that would crush the human from the earth. But we are called to more than that. We are called to be human, to delight in the unseasonal sun, to laugh with our friends, to celebrate vegetable gardens, to pet dogs, to play, to love each other. For what else, ultimately, whatever else there is, it is this common human decency that will save us from the terror that we face. It is common human decency, the sense that we are all part of the same human family, that each of us deserves respect, that each of us is worthy of love, that we strive to protect in these difficult times. And so, as I say today, if you feel overwhelmed, as I do, by the rising madness of it all, let us remember that it is important to march and to struggle, but it is more important to simply embrace, embrace the human in each other, to see the pain and joy in each other's eyes, it is by being human with each other that we will ultimately live into a world where truth, justice, and peace reign, and where the ter terror of totalitarianism is but a memory echoing in the past. As I close, I invite you to enjoy join with me in a simple prayer. O oh, spirit of life, that some call God and others name human goodness, be with each of us as we struggle to see the human in each other and remind us always that in our human hands and human hearts lies the power and the hope that we are looking for, the power to embrace our loves, the power to change the world for the better. And now, before the congregation says amen, I invite you into a minute of silence to honor the dead to consider our own work in the world of building the Cathedral of Justice and to contemplate all that has been said. We descend into silence with the hope that our sermon, with its many imperfections, has done its own small work in building the Cathedral of Justice and that our actions will do their part. There will now be a minute of silence.
and let us say, Amen.